Thank you. Uh, I'm Ruth Truss, and I'm happy to be here with the David Matthews Center folks again and to talk about reconstruction, everybody's most fun and exciting topic. Um, so we're going to dive right in, and I will not read all of these slides to you. You can read, um, but I, I will go through a little bit of um, some of the basics of reconstruction. And, and this is where I wish you were live because I could say if you had questions, uh, please feel free to ask them. But so the basics and the basics here refer to reconstruction generally. We're going to be talking about uh, reconstruction from 1863 to 1877, and that varies according to what state you're talking about. And as we get into this a little bit more, we will talk specifically about Alabama and the dates for that. Um, one of the interesting points to me about Reconstruction, about this whole period, is that it does provide an example of a time when checks and balances, that system that we set up, and I'm actually recording this on Constitution Day, so <laughs> this is a good uh, reminder that uh, it was, the system was set up with uh, those checks and balances so that one branch of government did not override the other one. Reconstruction is a time when that did not work well. This is a time when we can, we'll be able to see that Congress really gets the upper hand. Um, later, this whole era will be considered an unfinished revolution, and then depending on how far you go in your class, you can talk about the Civil Rights Movement, and sometimes you know that's referred to as the Second Reconstruction. So the idea that the Civil Rights Movement was trying to finish what this period, Reconstruction, began. Um, the end of Reconstruction, we say that Reconstruction ended in 1877. That's really talking about the end of political Reconstruction from the federal government's point of view. Um, because that is going to be, of course, the Compromise of 1877, which we will get to. And that's going to mean that that's when the federal government stops, uh, southern states would say interfering, <laughs> with state elections. In other words, when they will remove all federal troops from the final three states that were remaining by that point. The social and economic aspects and the David Matthews Center Guide uh, they really talk a lot about the social and economic aspects of Reconstruction. That is not so easily defined, uh, and certainly it does not fall within these years' limits. Um, and some people will argue that the impact of that is still ongoing, and certainly it was up through the 1930s in Alabama with uh, that was the high point of the tenancy system. So anyway, so, um, you know, it, one thing interesting about history, everything's sort of connected, right? You follow that, that thread and, and it just takes you on and on. All right, so uh, let's talk about the situational realities here. Um, the presidential reconstruction and then we'll have congressional reconstruction. And I have some handouts that I will give to the David Matthews Center, and they can share those if you're interested in them. Uh, that really delineates all of the specifications for each of these. Um, so I won't go into those, but you know, we had two presidential plans, Lincoln's plan and then Johnson's plan. And every state goes through at least well, it goes through a presidential plan, one or the other. Then Congress will take over, and we have technically three congressional plans. Um, one is the Wade Davis bill that's never implemented, but the ideas are going to be important. But remember, uh, Lincoln vetoed the Wade Davis bill, did a pocket veto with it. So, um, but, but the ideas that they presented in the Wade Davis bill find their way into the second and then the third so-called reconstruction um, congressional plans. And so every state will go through congressional reconstruction. 
So every state goes through two reconstruction plans, right? Now, um, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, of course, are the so-called Reconstruction Amendments, and those are key in terms of the legal aspects of political reconstruction. And again, you can see why the civil rights movement of the 1960s especially is considered the second Reconstruction. And then uh, we want to talk about the social and economic challenges because these are going to be really important and they'll also be key when you use your guide that the Matthew Center is, has published. Um, okay, so one of the things that we talk about are the aspirations of the freedmen. These freed slaves, what do they want? And so three, um, or four, depending on how you look at it, but um, uh, aspects here that are important. And think about equality and freedom. What does that mean? And uh, when we were working on this guide with the Matthew Center people, we, we had long discussions about what does that mean? How do you define that? In what context? So um, economic security and self-sufficiency, um, 40 acres and a mule, you know, that was the rumor that got started. And um, this right here, and this is just one of the sources that the David Matthew Center will have in, in that guide. This is, I uh, just abbreviated it, Up From Slavery, Booker T. Washington's book. And so I've just chosen that one to pull a few examples of quotes from that maybe you can use. So obviously we're interested in economic security, education. That was one of the things that the freedmen were very clear that they wanted at the end of the Civil War. They want an education because that had legally been denied them during the antebellum period. Um, some are interested in participating in self-government. Okay? And then in terms of religion, freedmen wanted separate churches. Right? They had been always forced to worship officially right, with whites and so they want to worship as they wish, on their own, without oversight. Okay. And the physical challenges here are just absolutely daunting when you think about how do you actually put this in practice, right? Economic security and self-sufficiency, that sounds fine, but how do you go about that? If you aren't going to be given 40 acres and a mule, and they weren't, that's why it's just a rumor, how, how do you secure that for yourself and your family? Right over here, uh, education and religion. Yes, we can understand that, but physically, just physically, where do you go? Where do you go to have school? Where do you go to have church? So those are going to be important uh, aspects to, to consider. All right, so let's look, focus now on social and economic factors. And one of the things that's very important to remember when we talk about reconstruction and especially political reconstruction is what Southern white attitudes were. And in the immediate post-war period, this is really crucial here. Look at how they're feeling. They are tired. They were glad the war ended. They were mad at Jefferson Davis. They were burning him in effigy by the time the war came to an end. And so this, this right here, was the optimal time for the U.S. to try to make significant changes. Okay? And had, it's almost, um, it's a shame that Congressional Reconstruction and, and that stricter take on what you expect Southerners to do, that that could not come during this period because this is when whites were just 
they're tired. We just need to move on and we're the defeated people. The victor can, t can determine the terms, right? And so I think this is one of the big lost opportunities in history in terms of sort of providing a fairer outcome for the post-war world in the South, right? Um, this, of course, is not going to last long. Right? Okay, so keep those economic and social realities in the back of your mind. And this is one of the things I like to do with my students. And uh, I, I, I think maybe no matter what age you teach, it would work. Um, put yourself in the place of. And you can put yourself in the place of any of these people, right? But let's look at the freedmen as an example, because what's going on with these people? What challenges do they face? Any of these groups, right? The plantation owner, we think about the plantation owner as wealthy and plenty of resources. That is not the case in the post-war South, right? Uh, yeoman farmers, most of these uh, had been conscripted or volunteered into the Confederate Army. So if they come home at all, if they come home uh, whole, right, there were so many amputations, right, as a result of the Civil War. So they are coming back to a farm that had not been tended to with let me put it this way. They are coming back to a farm that had been tended to without his assistance. So you might be talking about a wife, perhaps a couple of young children, um, maybe a slave or two, but most, most people did not own slaves. Right? Two-thirds of the people in Alabama did not, two-thirds of the white families did not own slaves. So um, think about what land looks like when it's not cared for. You know, uh, like if, if it rains a lot in the summer and you don't cut your grass for two or three weeks, <laughs> uh, then think about four years of that if you can't keep up with it. And then freedmen, they in particular have even greater challenges. Like what do they have? They have their freedom, right? You know, they have their freedom, but nothing else. And so just what are your options? And so this is what I like to have students do. From the very beginning, you know, all right, you're free. You, you don't like your for, former owner, let's say, and you want to go somewhere that has better opportunities. Okay, you're, let's, let's keep us in Alabama. You are in, let's say, Wilcox County, Alabama. You're ready to go. <laughs> Which way do you go first? I mean, do you know how to start out? Do you have clothes? Do you have food? You certainly have no money. Most people in the South have no money, and even if they do, is Confederate money, which is absolutely worthless. So the, the point of, well, they can go somewhere else. Technically, yes. Practically, that's a lot harder to have happen. Okay. okay. So one of the things here that's important, and this is where we start shifting those attitudes of the Southern whites at the end of the war. This is a really crucial time period because at this point these states have gone through presidential reconstruction most of them including Alabama through the Johnson plan and it was fairly easy you know you you tick off a few things um, then you go back you vote you have to you know disavow slavery and withdraw your ordinances of secession but pretty much then you're kind of back where you are back where you were and at that point white southerners are saying it's pretty easy that wasn't bad at all um, and so that 
low feeling, <laughs> that weariness. They start recouping from that. Now, this though, is at the same time, and, and the bolded here, all right, is talking, is uh, focusing on the socioeconomic issues. And we'll go back and bold the other things later when we talk about political issues. Right. Um, so this is the time period, really, that I think it's the opportunity for significant change is lost um, because of this changing white attitudes. This is where we have the lost cause. That idea starts creeping in. The idea that it was a wonderful cause. We were just outnumbered. You know, the North was just too strong. Um, God really was on our side, but you know, that's it, it, and so that's a different attitude than acquiescing in whatever the federal government wants to put on you. Uh, and then, at this same time, states begin passing what are known as black codes to. Uh, to deal with, target, however you want to look at it, uh, the freedmen. And a lot of this is because of that mobility of the freedmen. They're, they are starting, despite all the hardships, going, starting to move, right? There's some uh, fluidity in society now. And at the same time, white planters especially are looking for workers, right? They need help to get their fields ready for a spring planting. And this is also the time that the rumor of 40 acres and a mule starts, you know, really making the rounds. And so the freedmen are hesitant, of course, to sign up for a, a year's period of working when they, they might have the opportunity to have their own farm, right? So these start to, all of these things are coalescing at the same time. And again, we'll talk about the political aspects separately, but I, I want you to keep in mind sort of this timeline because all of these things are happening together. We'll talk about them separately just for organizational purposes, but the timeline is important. All right, I want to mention at least the Freedmen's Bureau. I won't linger on this, but uh, the Freedmen's Bureau is an unprecedented federal, and some people would say intrusion, right, into the states and into everyday life. The federal government had never done anything like this before. This is a welfare system on a massive scale, and Quickly, it will go away, and we won't see anything like it again, really, until uh, the Great Depression and FDR's alphabet agencies, right? So, uh, and for all the Im uh, importance that Southern states put on states' rights, many Southerners, including white Southerners, would have starved that first winter. It was a terrible winter across the South if it had not been for the Freedmen's Bureau assistance. And then, of course, the Freedmen's Bureau uh, has a role in helping to provide or helping to organize a place for schools and teachers to come and then to mediate contracts. And it's really in this aspect that the Freedmen's Bureau gets a negative reputation among some white Southerners. Right? Okay. So now let's talk about political factors, and we're back to this same slide, but now with different things bolded. Right? The elections, Southerners held elections, and you'll notice here, they had gone through presidential reconstruction, so they, they held their state elections. And guess what? When they elected these, their senators and representatives to send to Washington, every one of them are Democrats. It's like, we're just going back to the way things were prior to the war. And so Congress is going to, you know, 
start kind of scratching their head and saying, wait, what are we doing? We just fought four years and, and we're going back to the way things were with the exception that slavery is ended. And then they look at the black codes and they say, wait a minute, these, and the black codes included things like vagrancy laws, right? And you have to show that you have uh, employment. And if you can't show that you have employment, then you can be farmed out, almost literally, to a planter and you become his help. Well, so at these two elect, I mean, the, this election and that aspect of the Black Codes together is what's going to make Congress start, stop and think about, mm, maybe we need to take a step back, take a breath, and reevaluate here. Now, one thing here about the Black Codes, there were some positive aspects of, of that because it recognized things like uh, marriages, right? Slave marriages were not legally recognized. Um, you know, they had property rights. There's really no attempt early here to take away these sort of civil rights. That obviously is going to come later, but uh, at, at this point, the, the black codes have some positive aspects for these former slaves. All right, so what Congress is going to do in response is to establish this Joint Committee on Reconstruction. And this committee is really going to take the lead now in guiding Reconstruction, taking over what happens. And um, they will develop different plans, two different plans, but there will, and they will have more stringent terms than the presidential plans. All right, so um, so-called radical Republican uh, rule, the radical Republicans are in charge in Congress, and they, of course, are opposed to President Johnson. It's one of the big what-ifs in history. Sometimes historians like to talk about what if Lincoln had lived. Uh, how would this have been different? Would there have been a you know, a, a smoother transition here. Who knows? Um, so, and on that handout, I will, I will give you all the details about the uh, Congressional Reconstruction Plans. So, the Reconstruction Acts of 1867, that's really going to be the, the heart of what most Southern states including Alabama, will use. And initially, these acts, are there are three separate acts, and then we'll have a fourth one. You'll see here in the summer of 1868, and Alabama gets that one just for herself. And I'll explain why, if we have time. <laughs> okay, um, so again, I'm not going to read to you these provisions here, but uh, the they set out, you know, what the states have to do. And Congress is going to take the approach that, yeah, secession really worked, right? Presidential Reconstruction really was predicated on the idea that secession was impossible and therefore it didn't happen and that the states remained states. Congress is going to say, yeah, y'all committed state suicide and so we're going to treat you as conquered territory. And so you'll see here five military districts and they're going to put a general in charge of these. And so that's a clear indication that, they, that Congress is looking at this as yes, secession worked and so now we have to start from the very beginning and move you through that process. All right. um, here's some more. Must guarantee black suffrage. This is significantly different because most northern states at this time did not allow black suffrage. Okay? Now, clearly, the greater percentage of blacks was in the South, but uh, still, and that, that, of course, is one of the things white southerners is going to sort of point out, that you're being a little hypocritical here. Um, nobody really listens to that much. 
Now, the ratification procedure, look at what the ratification procedure, and, and we're talking about here ratifying a new state constitution. A majority of registered voters must participate in the election. Not a majority of those voting must participate, <laughs> but a majority of registered voters. And that little kind of loophole there is what uh, Alabama is going to take advantage of. And, you know, it, for a minute, it'll work. Now, again, here, just an example uh, with Alabama here in the role of radical Republicans. Who are the radical Republicans across the South? Carpetbaggers, scalawags, and the freedmen. Okay? Uh, that's basically it. Those who come down from the North, Right. Some of them obviously looking to take advantage of some of the opportunities, including economic opportunities. Um, some of them obviously to help, to assist. And then scalawags, those are native southerners who cooperate with the federal government. And then the freedmen, uh, they obviously will be Republicans because there's certainly not a place for them in the Democratic Party. Now, how did Southern whites respond? And I'm, I'm, you know this. Um, so groups such as the Ku Klux Klan, it's not the only one. Uh, there are other ones, at least two other ones, in Alabama alone that are sort of localized. But obviously the Klan is the most um, familiar one right, to us. And then Congress starts taking punitive action, you know, uh, and they'll pass the Ku Klux Act. And one of the things here, notice that Booker T. Washington said, yeah, I'm afraid we are going to be the ones to really suffer for what Congress is going to try to do to these Southern whites. Um, he's afraid of the backlash, obviously. Right? And it's not until 1871 and after the Ku Klux Act, the Klan will decline after that. But uh, for a few years there, it was uh, important in terms of influence and um, terrorizing the local population. Okay. Now, we start to get to uh, the end of Reconstruction. The process and the date, it differs according to state. So when you teach U.S. history, you know, we usually like to do it 1863 to 1877. It's at night's block, and this is where it begins. This is where it ends. And, but if you, you're teaching on the state level, that's not the case. Uh, and the final... Three states, right? and, and we'll talk about those, Florida, South Carolina, and Louisiana, those are going to be finally or redeemed right, through the Compromise of 1877. The terminology here is important. Right? Th these religious overtones, you know, we're redeeming the state. We're saving the state. And that has a major impact on how the narrative of Reconstruction is, how that plays out in the early history. You know, because early history of the Reconstruction period is, oh, it was terrible. It was just confined to uh, these Northerners who came down and wanted to take advantage, and they're crooks and schemers, and they did nothing good for the states. And you know that things are more complex than that. Yes, that was true for some people, but there were also good things that happened during um, redemption. Okay, so uh, this term sort of permeated <laughs> into um, the historical discourse. So we'll go, go ahead with that term. But All right, so and, and again, we're talking about political reconstruction. So this is just an example of what happens in Alabama. So it's not this linear road 
to redemption, right? There are shifts that are going to ultimately lead to the final redemption. I mean, it was a it was a mess. You know, sometimes we think politics is a mess now. It really was a mess <laughs> in the early 1870s. Uh, so redemption, of course, is when the uh, southern white elite take over. And so that's why oftentimes it's called bourbon control. It harkens back to the bourbon dynasty, you know, with Louis XIV in France. And uh, so that sort of elitism. Okay, so the election of 1876 obviously is going to be important. Grant clearly would have liked to have done a third term, but that uh, two-term precedent set by George Washington was so important and had such an impact that that's not going to change. And so here are our two major nominees, Rutherford B. Hayes, the Republican, and Samuel Tilden, the Democrat. Now, keep in mind that by this time, all but three southern states have been redeemed, and that essentially means that they are basically under democratic control. Okay? Uh, so there's the popular vote. And so when they talk about, oh, you know, popular vote, that, this, is, this is unusual. It's not unusual, <laughs> right? This is not the first time or the second or the third time that that's happened. Uh, the electoral vote, obviously, <laughs> is what's important. And in 1876, you needed 185 votes to win. So they had the election, they tally everything up, and Tilden is one shy, right? Hayes has 165, but there are 20 votes out there that are disputed. So clearly, you can do this simple math just as well as I can, Tilden needs one. <laughs> Hayes would need every single one of those 20 to, in order to win, but you've never heard of President Tilden, so you also know what happens. Um, now, on those 20 disputed votes, there's one from Oregon, and it was just sort of a technicality. It was clearly going to go into Hayes's category, right? So Tilden can't have that one. The remaining 19 come from these southern states that have yet to be redeemed, meaning they still have federal troops there that are overseeing the elections, and there are disputed election results in these states. Now, one of the things to notice in what's happening, what they're doing here, look, unofficial, <laughs> unofficial deals are going on behind the scenes, but then we have to have this official response. What, what officially is going to happen? And so uh, unofficial and official are, will both be important in actually ultimately resolving this uh, deadlock. Let's see. All right, so officially, Congress is going to set up an electoral commission. <laughs> you know? um, and so this is the, the layout initially. This is House of, uh, House of Representatives, Senate, and then Supreme Court, obviously. These are equal, right? This poor independent here, he is going to be the one who would be the tiebreaker. If this were to go along party lines, and it will, then this independent, his name was David Davis, Guess what he did? <laughs> he said, no, I want no part of this. <laughs> and his state, I can't even remember what state it was, he was a, uh, appointed to an unfinished senatorial seat. So he gets off the Supreme Court. <laughs> I don't blame him. And um, takes, takes that seat. And the only people left on the Supreme Court, the only men, were men uh, that would be identified as Republican, meaning they would, they would lean Republican. Justices aren't supposed to be uh, partisan, but. So that means that this number then is going to become three. Right? So officially, and this is what's going to matter officially, right? unofficially, 
This is what's happening behind the scenes. And what happens is that some um, folks from Ruther Ohio Republicans, which is Rutherford B. Hayes' hometown, uh, home state, um, they get together with some leading Southern Democrats and say, okay, what can we do? What kind of bargain can we establish here? And, but keep in mind, this is unofficial. Right? And so again, this is, this is uh, I'm, I'm, I won't read this to you, but this is what the Republicans say we will agree to if you don't dispute those electoral results and allow all the disputed votes to go to Hayes. In return, right, so the, you know, it's a compromise. Both sides have to give something. This is what the Southern Democrats promised they would do. And this is the key one for the immediate future, right? Um, accepting good faith of reconstruction amendments, refrain from partisan reprisals. Right. And believe it or not, the South will, for the most part, adhere to these. Both sides will adhere as much as they can to those terms. Uh, this one right here, the Republicans will support this, um, but that's a little bit later coming. This one, they'll put a man from Tennessee, David Keyes, in as um, postmaster general. That's not very um, glamorous sounding, but think about the patronage possibilities of the postmaster's position, right? So. So both sides eventually are going to, for the most part, adhere to the uh, terms of this agreement. So the Wormley House Agreement, it was a, a hotel, so sometimes it's called a house, sometimes it's called a hotel, but uh, you'll see there, February 26th, they, they meet at the Wormley House and sort of, okay, everybody knows their role. This is what we are agreeing to do. The Electoral Commission, right, they will vote on all disputed votes, those of 20, but, you know, really 19. And the vote is 8 to 7 down the line, okay? And so they send that to the um, House of Representatives February 23rd. By the time the House of Representatives convenes, we know that the Wormley House Agreement has been finalized. And so March 2nd, about four in the morning, right, uh, the House will vote to accept the Commission's eight to seven results. And therefore, two days later, Hayes is going to be inaugurated. So there's the map of how it turned out in 1876. So, you know, there's, that's a close election. One electoral vote is the difference. There. All right, so let's wind this up. I know you're probably getting tired and bored. Um, politically, once we go through that process and think about Think about how long we've had to mask. <laughs> What's that been? Six months, maybe? It seems like so long. <laughs> um, Reconstruction went on, I mean, in, think about Alabama, 1865 to 1874. I mean, it's nine years. You know, so this has been going on for over a decade nationally. Um, a lot of bitterness lingers after this is finally ended politically. Economic and social. And some of this I've put, in some cases, the, these also harken back to the Civil War, right? They're results from the war itself. The South, prior to the war, was a relatively wealthy area of the country. After the war, the South drops really to the bottom in terms of economic prosperity. And some will argue that it has, as a, as a whole, has stayed there. 
and that the South continues to deal with those lingering aspects of uh, the war and then the Reconstruction period. Now, we did not get into cropland and tenancy. That's one of the uh, areas that when I teach this, I really emphasize because you go back to those social and economic realities, they didn't have many options. Okay? Some people had land, others had the labor, and they both needed each other. And that's black and white. Um, so tenancy is the system that is going to hang around. The 1830s is, I mean, tenancy, the number of tenants in the state of Alabama increases until the 1930s. Uh, of course, that's the Depression. And then at that point, in the 1930s, there are more white tenant farmers than there are black tenant farmers. And I think we don't, we don't think in those terms. We think about tenancy being as former slaves, um, but whites will be drawn down into that as well. And a lot of that had to do with the crop lien system, taking out a loan on the crop that is yet to be produced. That's a huge risk for the person loaning the money, and so um, interest rates are incredibly high. But anyway, that's a different lecture. <laughs> um, and then both poor white and black farmers, they have so much in common in, common <laughs> in terms of socioeconomic situation. And that commonality will finally see expression when we get to populism, right? Uh, that's when, and it's true in Alabama, and that's, again, I mean, history's just interesting, right? I don't know why students think it's not. Um, but but how, how the populists are able to bring those concerns together and then how the Bourbon Democrats are able to split them apart. But anyway, which leads to the Constitution of 1901. And <laughs> so, uh, okay, but thank you for your time. At this point, I'd say, uh, do you have any questions? But uh, email me if you do. <laughs> thank you for your time. Mm -hmm.